End of Watch for Sunday, June 30th is for Charlotte's own Tavares Polk, a phenomenal singer, songwriter, and composer. He's perhaps best known for his supreme vocals on a duet he did with the R&B superstar Aaliyah called Never Giving Up off of her sophomore album, One in a Million. But there's so much more to his story and so much that remains untold. But we're going to get into some of it in today's episode. Born on April 8th, 1981, and hailing from Charlotte, North Carolina, Tavares had a knack for singing, and at just 11 years old, he had such a soulful voice that he sounded like a grown man who had lived a long time. In 1992, he joined a group called Soldier, and eventually became the lead singer. And after the group got great feedback from their hometown, the youngins would take a trip to New York in search of fame, and there they met with several executives, but none more famous than Devontae Swing of Jodeci who had started his own swing mob collective of up-and-coming artists. After hearing the boys sing, Devante felt that he had found the next Jodeci and told the boys that he would sign them in six months' time. Just be patient. But as young teens, them boys wasn't trying to wait no six months. They ended up catching the eye of another executive producer, Vincent Herbert. Which was uh, Lady Gaga's ex-manager, um, Tamar Braxton's ex-husband. He saw a vision in us and was like, hey... I want you guys. So he ended up flying down to uh, New, um, Charlotte to meet with us and meet our parents and everything. Cause at the time we were underage. So when he got there, he was like, okay, where the group at? And he looked over there and saw four little kids and was like, that's the group. And immediately saw money signs, you know, because we sounded older than we were. So at that point, uh, he wanted us to come aboard his uh, production company at that time, which was Three Boys from North. He later changed it to Streamline. After signing with Vincent's production company, he would fly the boys back to New York to meet Sylvia Rome, who at that time was the head of Atlantic Records' East-West division, and she wanted to sign the group to her label. But they needed a manager and didn't have one. After a bit of scouring and looking around, they found the perfect manager to lead the way, the infamous Barry Hankerson who at this point had been managing R. Kelly and is the uncle of Aaliyah. After securing management and a new record deal with East West Electra, the group would move to New York and underwent artist development over the next three years, writing and recording their music, working with different producers, etc. Eventually, the group had a full project completed and were ready to go, but issues between Vincent Herbert and Electra Records, who had forked out a hefty budget for his artists, only to not see a return on their investment in a timely manner, led to the two entities parting ways, dropping all artists who were up under Vincent as well. So after three years, the teens were having to return to Charlotte, embarrassed and with nothing to show for their time away. But just six months later, they got the call that the label wanted Tavares, and Tavares alone, for a special project. And so he got flewed out, this time to Detroit, first class. And the label hooked him up with some money, took him shopping for a new wardrobe, since it was snowing there and he only had light North Carolina clothes on. They set him up in a nice apartment and got him over to Vanguard Studios, which was the same studio that Anita Baker did her Rapture album in. They wanted him as part of the team who would write and record several songs for Aliyah's upcoming sophomore project called One in a Million. He'd been working alongside Craig King, who penned the song Never Given Up with another writer, Monica Payne, and brought in Tavares to sing the demo. Craig said that Tavares was like 13 or 14 years old at that time and that he had sang the male part and killed it. Aaliyah had fell in love with his voice too, so we kept him on it. He came in and owned it. He sounded like a grown man. I'm giving my love to you day and night. Aaliyah, I'm gonna be loving you. Feeling so strange when I was on the train. I cracked a smile on every thought of you. The things that you do makes me feel so good inside. Oh, no need to lie to you. I'm giving my love into you day and night. Leah, I'm gonna be loving you. Tavares said, I was just shocked to finally get to meet someone like her. It was always neat to work with an artist or do a duet with an artist that was already on that level as she was. It was great. When I met her, we clicked instantly. The vibe was good in the studio. 
We rehearsed it at the piano before she even went in the booth. It was good because we all got to vibe and really learn the song before we went in there and did it. It was a great sight. I picked up my little pointers from her and etiquette of how to record in front of the mic and the different things with the headphones that you can do. I arranged my own verse at the time. I did get to put my own energy and input into the record as well. I coached a few of the ad libs that her and I did together on that record. And Craig said that when Brandy and Wan Ye visited him in the studio not long after, that Brandy had asked him, what's Aaliyah working on right now? I want to hear it. So he played Never Giving Up. And with tears in her eyes, Brandy said, she absolutely destroyed this. This is her new sound? And he replied, yeah, this is where she's going. Now Tavares has said that him and Baby Girl became real good friends after that, and that they used to shop together, as Aaliyah had a 90s tomboy style. Tavares and his friends would end up copping the same shoes in the same color that Aaliyah bought, and she would be like, why y'all jocking me? And they would say, whatever, we're just buying what we think is hot too. He said, we would sing on each other's voicemails all the time. We had two-way pagers. I would sing on hers and she would sing on mine as well as Missy's. The initial feeling was great. I was the first male artist other than R. Kelly that she had ever did a duet with on her own project, so it meant a lot. After doing that, she told me herself that I was her favorite male singer. I hold that dear to me even to this day. Tavares had a knack for impressing anyone who was in earshot of his vocal talents and his efforts were always praised by members of their camp. However, one person who was not at all a fan of Tavares was the Pied Piper himself, R. Kelly. According to Tavares, R. Kelly didn't like him for many reasons, actually. He was essentially his replacement, as Barry was no longer managing R. Kelly, but instead pouring into this new kid who can sing, and is actually age-appropriate for Aaliyah, being just two years younger than she was, and now being Aaliyah's second lead vocalist, and the only other male singer to duet with Aaliyah. Sure, she had songs with a few rappers and of course with Timbaland the producer, but they wasn't singing the way that Tavares and Baby Girl was on a sensual song that was and still is a fan favorite. This led to there being friction whenever Tavares was around R. Kelly, which wasn't often, but enough times for him to peep it. That didn't stop his shine though. He began working with the team on another song called I Care For You, and he did all the vocal arrangements for that track. Initially, this song was meant for the group Soldier, but Blackground wanted it, so they worked out a deal to buy it from him, and the decision was made for Aaliyah to sing it, which she did, but she had already completed her sessions for the One in a Million album, so it was too late in the game to be included on that project. It will remain unreleased until five years later when she included it on her self-titled third album because she had always loved it and wanted to see it see the light of day. Though selling the song meant that he wouldn't be included in the credits, Tavares was a genius at his craft, and no one could take that from him, and he did mention that he had been offered numerous times to take a shortcut to becoming a superstar and being among the elites. I will say that I was approached to be among some of the elites that we all still know today, and, um, you know, invited to a few of these, you know, little parties and different things like that, and saw some things that actually you know made me step back apparently the ticket to fame was always there but the price of selling your soul wasn't worth it so he decided to continue trying to make music with his group and hopefully they could snag another record deal in the meantime he'd assist in writing and doing vocal arrangements on songs for other artists all while being paid under the table and not appearing on album credits basically signing the rights away for an undisclosed amount which actually happens more often than not in this industry. A few of the many songs that he had worked on were records like I Really Want to Show You from Biggie's posthumous album Born Again in 1999. The song was a reworking of the song Everyday Struggle. 
Then you had Heaven Can Wait by Michael Jackson off of his Invincible album in 2001 and Speechless by Beyonce in 2003, all phenomenal fan favorites, none of which featured Tavares' name in the credits. As for the group Soldier, they went on to snag a record deal with Sixboro Entertainment and Motown Records, though Tavares, being the jack of all trades, continued to create music not just for his group, but for other artists in their camp. He had worked alongside many dope producers, including Andreo Fanatic Heard, who had become like a brother to him, and was the producer on the songs that I had just mentioned previously. Together, the pair were also the first to work with Leah LaBelle on a few of her demos, as she was fresh from American Idol at that point. Although their recordings would never see the light of day because Leah backed out of the contract with Sixboro as it was too binding for her liking. This took place after Soulja themselves were let go from their deal with Sixboro and Motown. Afterwards, they disbanded and one of their group members would pass away in a car accident. Leah herself met the same fate years later, but it was the death of Aaliyah that made Tavares take a step back from seeking the spotlight. After Leah died, um, I stepped away. You know, I, I, I kind of disappeared with her music because it was like, is this what I really want? You know, is this is this my dream that I had? You know, yeah. through the money is amazing. But the things that they want you to do outside of what you want to do, it gets a little crazy. He would stay behind the scenes writing and composing music under the table for artists like Nas, JoJo, Tamar Braxton, and even Benzino, believe it or not. As a matter of fact, most of the credits that he did receive were in group recordings, one for a group called Into You and another for a group called Mindless Behavior on their song Looking For You, which was on the special edition of their sophomore album All Around the World. Crazy part is that song was probably my favorite on the album, mainly for its vocal arrangements, despite the heavy auto-tune usage that was ever so present in all of the group's songs. But before he had even worked with Mindless Behavior, he found himself in another group of his own called Sign Sealed Delivered, or SSD for short. They recorded several demos and did many live shows but didn't snag any record deals. And so Tavares would start his own label called A What A Hit Music Group, which he promoted heavily on his social media. The group, now a trio called Official, would record new music and decided to name their album Sign Sealed and Delivered. As it had been a few years, and they wanted to stay true to the name. They released two music videos for their song, Owe It All To You. I'm so proud to say you're mine, and I can read between the lines. It's reality, there will never be another girl for me. In his 2016 interview with Vibe magazine, Tavares stated that his new group had planned to do a remix of Never Given Up to coincide with the 20th anniversary of Aliyah's One in a Million album and that he hoped that the world would get to hear it real soon, of course with Blackground Records permission. But at the time, Barry Hankerson, who was the owner of that label, had all the music on lock like Fort Knox. And while some samples could be cleared, during this time most wouldn't, so their remix never came to fruition, and neither would Official's album. Instead, Tavares would drop a mixtape on SoundCloud himself called The Black Album. In 2018, Tavares would go on to be featured on the song Bounce Back by Russell the Hustler, which was a nice joint. I actually just added it to my playlist. And though Tavares wasn't featured in the music video for this song, he did drop his own music video for the song Shoulda Coulda Woulda, which was a heartfelt ballad that was featured in the film River Runs Red. This track received rave reviews and his vocals were compared to those of Sisko and Tyrese. He had also appeared on the songs What's It Gonna Be by Betty Grind and Diamonds by Skino Green, among other songs. And on all of these features, he announced himself as Tavarius, even though those close to him call him Tavares. Now around this time, he would also showcase his weight loss, which surprised many people who had teased him over the years about the amount of pounds that he had put on. But he would take to Facebook to reveal that losing the weight wasn't done for the sake of looking good, but for something more serious. He announced that he had been battling kidney failure, and that the pain that he had experienced was insurmountable. He said it changed my life in ways I couldn't imagine, with lots of doctor's appointments. But I want to be here for my family and friends, and to see my son and his brother grow up to be successful black men. 
so I stepped away from music and many wondered why, what's going on? I wasn't ready at the time to talk about it. I didn't even know what I would say. It took some time for me to understand what good could come from this and God opened my eyes. I'm supposed to talk about it because someone else is going through this as well or someone knows or has a family member going through it and they need to see and hear my story to know that life's not over. Stay the course, don't give up, you can still accomplish your dreams. I am living proof that everything I have asked God for and more is happening right before your eyes and mine. I won't stop. He revealed that he had to lose the weight in order to be placed on the list to receive a kidney transplant. Once he did that, he was told that he would also need an additional $700 to be marked active on the recipient list by September of 2019. So he had put together a GoFundMe to raise donations. He had also set up a fund for the Kidney Transplant Dialysis Association, Inc and set it up to where all the proceeds went directly to the association and he wouldn't be able to touch it. Talk about a selfless act. Unfortunately for Tavares, more people had donated to the association than to his personal GoFundMe, which was short several hundred dollars. Then COVID hit and well, y'all remember how hospitals were. Everything and anything that wasn't directly related to COVID was placed on back burner for well over a year. By mid 2021, his family was holding cookouts to raise more funds for his transplant. But ultimately, it was when Barry Hankerson got up off his behind and re-released all the music that he kept locked away that the residuals from Tavares' workings with Aaliyah, Jojo, and Tank would begin pouring in and blessing that bank account. And eight months later, Tavares was not only on the donors list, but was now in the hospital on call awaiting a possible kidney match. But ultimately, it wasn't a positive match. He would receive surgery a month later, but only to remove the excess skin that he had from his weight loss. What's up, everybody? Surgery went great. Right now, I'm just recovering. Thank you all for the kind words and the prayers. I appreciate it all. Now wait till y'all see me again. Throughout this painful process, he still kept at it with work behind the scenes. He had founded his own management company called Done Deal Management and began managing some of the local talents. One of the artists was an alternative singer named Tiana Delaney whose debut EP reached number 7 on the alternative charts in the summer of 2022, a feat that Tavares was proud of. And if you wanted to book Tiana, you had to hit up Tavares for all inquiries. Okay then. He was a vocal coach for years, but went on to start a three-part course in vocal training, which guaranteed results in just 30 days. He had also started up a business transporting cargo in the Charlotte and surrounding areas. The man stayed busy, but his treatments on dialysis took a toll on his body. As a matter of fact, just last year, Tavares would have a full in-depth interview with Club Rich host Ashley Richmond, where he was slated to give a rundown on what all he had endured throughout his career in music. But due to his dialysis treatments, he overslept and would hop on the video call 25 minutes late and in the dark, which he apologized for as it was unlike him. But he still gave great insight into his career with the remaining time left. But also in the interview, both he and the host spoke about how they both tried to get into the mainstream, but backed away when they were shown just what all came along with being famous. Tavares also revealed that he was working on a book, which details his time in the industry, which he was turning into a series, and that he still wanted to chase his dreams of being a star, but on his terms. Put it this way, instead of chasing the industry, now the industry is chasing me. I don't want to be a part of their game because their game comes with you know contracts where they own you and you know they want to you know do stuff to your family and you know you know sexual things to you and it, it gets a little deeper it's a big rabbit hole you know if you're not mentally stable it, it'll eat you alive it'll definitely send you through you know what I'm saying, a warp, because it's, it's a lot of things that go on in the industry yeah. that, you know, people that don't know, they, they it's like they're fiending to be a part of it, not understanding what they're getting themselves into. Because mm. I'm, I'm, I'm telling my dirt too, so. You ain't scared? I'm not. I mean, because at the end of the day, you know what I'm saying, why, why, yeah, yeah. I'm, prote I'm, I'm protected by my father in heaven, so. You know, whatever happens to me here, I'm not afraid of no man, only God. You know? For this series, he planned to go in depth about the ins and outs of the wicked industry. And at the time, he also mentioned that he had three networks that wanted to pick up his series and that all three had put in bids. So it was down to whoever had the best offer that could also allow him to still own a decent percentage of the licensing. 
Ultimately, he wanted to make sure that he could feed his family for generations to come off of his legacy and life story, as they had sacrificed so much so that he could chase his dreams. But just a year later, on Father's Day of 2024, Tavares' wife of 23 years wrote on Facebook that he had passed away. This came as a shock to everyone who knew him and many Aliyah fans who knew of him. People like Craig King and Andreo both paid their tributes to him in online videos and they both expressed how underrated Tavares was and how bad the industry used him for what they can get from him and spit him out. But that's the ways of the music business unfortunately. Tavares would be laid to rest on Saturday, June 22nd, 2024 and his exact cause of death was not made public. Y'all make sure to check out Tavares' interview with Club Rich as it is the most in-depth piece that we have on him. Hopefully somebody will put out a full story or documentary diving deeper into his life. For now, his independent recordings are available on streaming platforms. Go check them out and show your support. Also, the recent passing of his father inspired him to create some gospel music which he released independently to streaming platforms. And one of his former group members, Nate from Brooklyn, has told a few stories of Tavares and posted many of the group Soldiers demos over the years. Feel free to check out his channel and listen to their songs as well. All in all, rest in peace to Tavarius Marquise Polk. You live your life in song, regardless of the industry's involvement or lack thereof. You contributed to some of the greatest sounds in existence, and that they can never take away from you or your namesake. This is Justified by Jury. Y'all know how to hit that like, and y'all know how to hit that subscribe. If you want to, do so, and hit the notification bell, and I'll catch y'all in the next video.